Well, here's a, again, these are courtesy of Paul Markowski. He's probably got the best illustration around right now. The idea is you need a downdraft. You can't just have an updraft in the walls. There has to be a downdraft to reorient the vorticity. And in this case, the vorticity, you see these vectors. This is the vorticity vector. So it's mostly horizontal. And as this parcel descends, it becomes more vertical. And then when you have it co-located with the polo updraft, you can ramp up to tornado proportions pretty rapidly. Now the question is, this isn't necessarily the same as the non-mesocyclone case. There's precipitation. That often produces cold outflow. The air, if the air is too dense, it doesn't matter what the storm is doing. It can try to draw it out, but if, it, if it's not unstable enough to support the deep updraft, it just sits there. It's like molasses. You may have spin, but you don't have any way to amplify it. If it's not too cold and it's lifted strongly, now you can amplify it. To so the key here is we're going to focus on not too cold and that strong lift with the mesocyclone. All right, again, what about these terms? First of all, the hopeless part is we have no direct observations of any of this stuff. This is occurring down on a scale of hundreds of meters. I mean, if maybe mobilized in that's every once in a while, but it's, it's extremely unusual to have any kind of useful information. So I can't just go out and say, well, hey, what are the rear flight downdraft temperatures going to be today? I don't know. You drive into it and tell me. That's the only way we're going to find it. <laughs> But, but it's, it's not as hopeless as I made it sound because we can infer these things. We have things that we call a proxy for this, where something that tells us a lot about what's going on, it may not be a direct relationship, but it tells us a lot about what's going on in the roof line down. What about the low level stretch? Okay, so here's another big supercell storm. I think this one is a Colorado storm, if I remember right. It's a Lyman Yeah, it's one of the, well, there's several Lyman storms. It's one of those. <laughs> Okay, so we've got storm rotation, the clear banded structure. This is the reflection of the mid-level mesocyclone. The wind shear, in this case, there's flow from the rear of the storm into the storm on the low levels. This creates the horizontal vorticity. And I'm a football fan, so I like the football part of it. Streamlines vorticity, this flows into the updraft. So there's where you get your direct rotation. This here, the vorticity is created by, by the environmental shear, and it goes straight into the updraft. So we've got a strongly rotating storm. That doesn't give us a tornado. That just gives us a supercell. Okay, we continue. The key is what's going on down here in the part of the forward flank and the rear flank of the storm, right on the edge of the precipitation. What is going on there? In this case, remember the right-hand rule. This one, the ascent, if you look at the orientation of this vorticity vector, it points back toward the storm. So it's kind of along the forward flank and your thumb's pointing back. That's the baroclinic vorticity that's generated by the temperature gradient on this part of the storm. Now notice it's still horizontal. It's kind of, the key here at the end of this path is that downdraft reorients the vorticity. Now I'm gonna admit up front, this is by far the most complicated part of this whole process. And I think there are probably four or five people walking the face of the earth that can sit down and explain this mathematically in detail and reproduce it. I'm not one of them, but it fits with my observations. So. The idea is, I don't think that we have tornado genesis absolutely 100% locked down, but I'd say we're probably 95% of the way there with this explanation. Okay, so the strong suction from above. We talked early on that it's related to the strength of the rotation in the storm. The stronger the mesocyclone you can get closer to the ground, the stronger the low level stretching. And so the question is, what do we observe? What is it? Do we actually see stuff like this happening in the real world? And I'll show a case that was a kind of obvious example of it all happening. We see strengthening the middle of rotation. If you have observations, you'll get strong pressure falls below that, or reflection of low aloft. You'll have strengthening storm inflow, and then you'll see these forced, like laminar cloud structures, which is an indicative of forced descent. That's area that's not just convectively rising on its own. That is forced descent. <coughs> This is the El Reno supercell from a couple, a year and a half ago. This is what it looked like, and I'll show you in about 15 minutes after this. So we've got, actually, we already have strong storm inflow. This is about 3,000 feet off the ground, 65 knots in the storm relative sense, back into the west. There's your 
lowest level reflection of the mesocyclone evolved. This is just 15 minutes later or 10 minutes later. The storm inflow has now increased over 80 knots in just 10 or 15 minutes. You're starting to see reflection. That's actually the beginning stages of the El Rio tornado. If we look aloft, this is pretty strong rotation anyway. The rotational velocity, 58 knots, that means the difference is over 115 knots across that. So what happens? It increases to 70 knots. This is very strong rotational aloft that's occurring coincident with the inflow increase. So these things are all related. You could argue it's a chicken and egg problem. And then it just so happens there's the start of the tornado, that very small circulation. So the mesocyclone is much bigger. There's the start of the tornado. What is the reflectivity field? Does it suggest that the updraft strengthened? It's this kind of amorphous blob at about 20,000 feet at this point. There's high reflectivity. Huge bounded weak echo region shows up. Again, 10 to 15 minutes, these structures show up. And that's, again, a sign of a very strong updraft which is coincident with the mesocycle. And then the low levels, we redefine, we just redistribute the rainfall and the storm to get the standard hook configuration. And then this is essentially the start of the El Reno tornado. What about not too cold? So that tells us that if we want the storm to, we want to see strong low level stretching that is produced by the storm itself, you want to see the rotation increase dramatically down close to the ground. Not at the ground, but close to the ground. The not too cold part just says something about how resistant is that air down in the low levels to being lifted. If it's very cold and dense, it's not going to work very well. If it's relatively warm and moist, a different story. And again, remember this originates in the RFD, so it kind of poses a conundrum here. What is, is downdraft air normally unstable? What, what does a thunderstorm do? Does anyone know the basic purpose of a thunderstorm in our environment? It's to stabilize. It's to bring cold, relatively cold, dense air down and warm, moist air up and out. So the idea of a thunderstorm, this kind of rear flying downdraft in a tornadic supercell is completely counter to what 99% of all the thunderstorms on the face of the earth are trying to accomplish. That's the whole reason they're there. So the question is, why do we get this difference, and we'll talk about it. So again, if it's too cold and stable, which in this case means we don't have any cape, that rear flank downdraft air has no cape, it's, it's stabilized like it's supposed to, it doesn't matter how much spin there is, you won't get a tornado of any consequence. However, if it's relatively large cape and little convective inhibition, and you have to spin with it, you can rapidly amplify this to an intense tornado. Okay, so this is what we were talking about before, and again, the paradox, is in slightly fancier terms, it's that you want the stronger your temperature gradients with the gust fronts, the stronger the vorticity generation. The stronger the temperature gradients, the colder and denser the outflow. So it's a conundrum. If it's too cold, you generate tons of vorticity, but you can't lift the air. If there's no temperature gradient, you can lift it, but you don't generate any vorticity. So we need something in between. And in this case, co-located with a strong rotational law. Okay, so here's some examples up here of what happens with real storms where we did have observations, where people did drive in the RFD, like I asked you earlier. <laughs> they were driving in. These are two tornadic storms from a vortex back in the mid-90s. The important thing here is the pink colors. That reflects air around the rear flank downdraft part of the storm that is similar to just as warm as the background inflow air of the storm. So, in this case, where it's kind of the cool pinkish colors, the air around the, that's feeding the tornado is actually just as unstable as the background inflow. So there's just as much chaos. The non-tornadic storms, and these are just two examples of, you know, dozens that they collect. The non-tornadic ones are deep into the blue colors. That means that the temperatures are quite a bit colder and the air is more dense than the inflow air. There's a lot less cape and there's a lot more convective inhibition. It's consistent across a wide variety of storms when we can't observe it. All right. What happens to the air, and this just shows where they ran the trajectories, this is just a fancy way to see where did the air end up in those storms. So they started with air right around the low level mesocyclone, and what happens to it? In this case, the ones with the warmer flight downdraft, they erupt upward, and they, they're part of the deep updraft of the storm. So those parcels are feeding the super cell updraft, the mesocyclone. That's the case where if they have a lot of vorticity with them, you can get a tornado. 
This is what happens to the same kind of trajectories when the air was too cold. You see that little bump? The air comes in, it tries to lift it. Uh, you know, I can't do it. It's like trying to pull the anchor up. It's just too heavy. So again, we piece this back together. If you have a weak low aloft, the mesocyclone itself isn't that strong, and the air is not particularly um, warm and moist down low, it's hard to get a tornado. If this rotation is very strong, and the key is you can observe the rotation with the radar. I can't, you're not going to sit around, hey, what's the pressure perturbation look like at 700 millimeter? You don't know, but you have a proxy for it in the radar data. The 88D will tell you, gee, this storm is rotating very strong close to the ground. That means there's a strong low, there's strong, well, it's drawing air in very aggressively. And again, it reorients this vorticity here along the downdraft, and this is drawing the low level circulation and amplified to a tornado. And the neat thing about a supercell is that once you get this, you get kind of a balance going in the extreme cases, the tornado just keeps going. It's rare, but it can do that. Okay, more on not too cold. Okay, what, I've already said we don't have observation of any of this stuff, so how do we deal with it? You know, that, you're never going to have a direct observations, but we do have stuff in the environment that correlates reasonably well with how cold is that downdraft air. And it's the LCL height. So if you're wondering why the LCL height gets the emphasis, it's not perfect. It reflects probably two-thirds of the variation that you see in rear flight downdrafts. But when you have low, high LCLs, there's more potential for evaporation or rainfall and that sort of thing. And there's more potential to produce a strong cold pool. It can be too cold and too dense. And the storm can't do anything with it. The special case is when the LCL is low, there's not much chance for that any evaporative cooling. So the rain that's generating those little gradients, they tend to be weaker, which is, but they're not non-existent, and the air tends to retain whatever buoyancy it has, because you just can't cool and stabilize it much. And this all leads to a positive feedback. When you piece it all together, you get a positive feedback between these things. So we've got buoyancy and vertical shear, give us a persistent rotating up there after. Low pressure aloft strengthens as the mesocyclone strengthens. That leads to forced sucking in air more strongly down on the low levels, that stronger stretching. And if the RFD air is not too cold and stable, then we can amplify that to a tornado if you've got vorticity with it. So the idea is that all this stuff fits together and you're, what you're doing is you're creating a conceptual model that says in a probabilistic sense, what's the chance of a tornado? Okay, so here's just an example, typical thing. If you want to just look at a storm and you want to just keep in your mind what parts of, what of the storm matter in what way, typical inflow air, that's just your supercell sustenance. That's what's keeping this storm going. You're just thinking kind of the background environment. Why do I have a supercell here in the first place? Low level updraft, we're looking, we're starting to deal with some of the boundaries that are generated by the storm. So it's the forward flank air that typically feeds back into the low level mesocycle. If there's a lot of vorticity generated, the right hand rule a lot of, along that boundary, then you can tilt and stretch that. That means the mesocycle aloft is it becomes stronger, closer to the ground, which increases the stretching term. Then the air feeding the tornado is back in here, and that's where the thermodynamic characteristics become critical. If this is too cold, too stable, which is the case most of the time, then you're not going to get much of the tornado. All right. So again, we'll just sort of summarize. These are the three things. It's just another way to state what I've said several times over. If you want a recipe for supercells, tornadoes, it's just can we get a right moving supercell? Typically, we're not worried about the left movers. Because there's so few left moving tornadoes. Is the in, does the inflow support amplification of the wall of the mesocyclone and will the RFD here support tornado genesis? So what I want to do now is what are we how are we doing on time? I didn't 10 minutes? Okay, good. Well, because I wanted to get to this because I want to tie it together to some of the environmental ingredients. So hopefully, based on what we've talked about so far, you'll be able to see why on earth we do some of what we do with the composite. And I'm going to focus on the super salt composite and the significant tornado parameter. And hopefully it'll make sense why they are put together the way they are. Again, we can, if we want to use this as a forecaster, you know, I, unless you're just driving into tornadoes, that's not going to help you forecast them. That might tell you that it's occurring, but it's not going to help you forecast them. We can calculate K 
from soundings. We can calculate vertical wind shear. The question is though, you know, okay, how much? I haven't said anything quantitative about the shear. We need lowable shear for storm rotation. That's the horizontal vorticity. But we also need enough vertical shear to keep the precipitation away from the updraft. Because if it just rains down on itself, the storm's not going to last very long. Even if it tries to rotate. What do we mean by low level shear? This is where you have to, you know, the rubber meets the road. We have to actually quantify this stuff or you can't, because I can sit here and just wave my hands and say, oh, well, there's low level shear, we'll get tornadoes. Well, how much? What are we talking about? In this case, we're talking about the storm inflow layer. That's what's feeding the updraft of the supercell. So, okay, what is the storm inflow layer? Again, this rotation doesn't mean anything if it's dry, stable layer. It's got to be potentially buoyant air. It's got to be feeding the deep updraft, or it just doesn't matter. So this is where the concept of the effective inflow layer comes in. What we're doing is we're trying to estimate what air is actually feeding the thunderstorm updraft. So in simplest terms, all we do is we get a sounding and we lift every little level on the sounding and we calculate cape and convective inhibition. And all the ones that have enough cape and not too much inhibition, and they're all strung together, that's the inflow layer. In this case, what, what you see on the SPC mesoanalysis page is if the parcel has at least 100K, not much, and no more than 250 cents. So these are pretty flimsy criteria. I mean, this, you know, you wouldn't normally go around saying, wow, that's great, you got 100K and 250 cents today. <laughs> the point is, we're trying to account for the fact that the storm is drawing the air in. The supercell is actually sucking this air in and forcing it up. So can we get any, any energy back to the system? If there's no cape, the whole thing will collapse on itself. What does this look like on a sounding? Again, I'll show you an elevated storm because that's where it's probably the clearest to see it. Here, this is the air that's feeding the updraft. And if you look over to the left, if on these soundings, I've always had this curious little bar and whisker looking thing. That is we, where we go in the background with the code and it lifts all these parcels and it says from there to there, we meet those criteria with 100 tape or no more than 250 cent. So this is the air feeding the updraft. It's not the most unstable parcel is right here, but air for quite a ways around that could be involved in the updraft. So there's a layer to it. It's not just a point. What does that look like on a photograph? Well, if we place that layer, the same vertical coordinates on there, it's the it's this area here. And that area would swept out, that little pie piece, that's the effective storm element velocity. And this is what it would look like for an elevated storm. You notice it's ignoring the wall of vertical shear because there's no cape associated with that, so it doesn't matter. <coughs> deep layer shear, same question comes into mind. Okay, what's deep enough? What are we talking about? Well, the deep layer, we just have to do something with respect to storm depth. We've got to look high enough to consider where the precipitation's forming and in numerical simulations going way back into the early mid-80s, it was suggested that the vertical shear has to go at least five or six kilometers up into the storm before you get long lift structures. And observations confirm this. So how do we account for storm depth? That's where the effective bulk wind difference, or the effective shear, is it's more commonly known. What we do here is we consider the storm depth and the storm inflow layer at the same time, and then we just look at percentages of that storm depth to calculate the shear of. All right, same sounding. This is the storm depth, or what we're talking about, the equilibrium level up at the top, the base of the storm inflow layer. The whole depth is what we're considering to be the convective storm. So we want to look at some measure of vertical shear from some part of that depth. What part of the depth? Well, in this case, Anyone's familiar with box and whisker plots? I mean, if you've seen them before, this is sort of a summary of a bunch of them. The idea here is if you see in blue, these are non-supercell storms, and this is the, the, the magnitude of the vector wind shear over the whole depth of the storm, you know, from just the very bottom of it all the way up to the top. So this is, these are the strongest shears that we see with a sample of non-supercell storms. In red, these are the weakest shears that we see with supercell storms. Where are the, you know, why wouldn't we choose up here? Why would somebody say, why, why wouldn't you want to choose up there? Look at the difference. What did it pronounce? Does anyone see a problem with saying, why don't we look through 90% of the storm? Looks like there's a bigger difference between them there. 
Think about what that's showing. This is the strong shear for non-supercell storms. Radar observed storms with no rotation and the weak shear for supercells. This means they overlap. You can't tell the difference between them as well. There, but down here, right here in the mid-levels of the atmosphere, you can tell that's the biggest difference between them is the least overlap between the weak supercell cases and the strong non-supercell cases. So the idea is this is the biggest difference is actually in this kind of plot where they are closest together. So we say that's about 50% of the storm depth. So this is where the effective bulk wind difference comes from. So we decide, hey, this is where the differences between non-supercells and supercells are most pronounced. That's the layer over which we're going to look. All right, so the effective bulk wind difference, most of the time it looks just like the familiar 0 to 6 kilometer wind shear. It's the, it's the same idea because a typical sounding extends, has an equilibrium level about 12 kilometers. What's half of 12? 6. You end up, and most storms are surface-based on the plane. So you end up with something that looks like the 0 to 6 shear. But it's much more flexible than that. In the case of an elevated storm, it actually works just as well, or with little squatty storms or very tall ones. A case like Gerald, if you remember that one from the 90s. A lot of the standard measures of vertical shear were pretty weak, but the storm top on that was like 18 kilometers up. It wasn't 12, it was way up there. So if you go half of that depth, guess what? It looked like a super solid profile. Again, so we can look at shallow, tall, and elevated storms, and the standard surface space all at the same time. So you don't have to pick a different parameter by assuming the outcome in advance. You can use the same wind shear measure before you even know what kind of storm it will be. All right, so right moving supercells, when we combine this, and we have to give a shout out, I mean, to our host here. <laughs> this was clearly a right moving supercell. A supercell composite parameter. So what do we do with these things? How do we put them together and why? We want to combine the measures of buoyancy and vertical wind shear that are relevant to supercell, right moving supercell formation. And then we want to compare these to what are typical values. So if you can decide, okay, is this a really high end supercell environment or is it just something that's kind of on the low end? And then by multiplying terms together, when you see the equation here, it's not a super fancy one for you. There's no young rules and differentials and all that crap. When you multiply them together, that gives you the mathematically the way to compensate. So the cape can be larger and the shear a little weaker, or vice versa, and you can still get the same answer. Okay, so the effective layer is super cell composite parameter. We've looked at a whole bunch of cases, and a thousand joules per kilogram is just a kind of normal low end cape value for elevated and surface based super cells. So we normalize that. That means we divide by a thousand. If you get above a thousand, this term goes over one. If you're less than 1,000, this is a fraction. It'll be something less than one. And then we multiply this, the effective bulk shear term, 20 meters per second, this is, it's the same to 40 knots. So we're looking, 40 knots is a typical uh, super solid shear value. If it's weaker than that, this term goes down. If it's stronger, it goes up. And then we take the low level shear. Typically, it's only like 50 to 100. So the effective SRH isn't large on average most storms when you look at a big sample. So again, you can see how in this case, if you put 2,000 K, 60 or 30 meter per second shear and 100 SRH, every term is bigger than one. And when you multiply all of those, the result is much bigger than one. So values of 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 are when you start putting in high end values of K and shear. And again, does this work when you look at samples? This is a box and whisper plot where Instead of doing a scatter plot, we just summarize everything. 70, 50% of all the observations fall between here. If anyone's familiar with percentile rank, like you take 100 values and you line them up from the lowest to the highest. Number 75, number 25, so the middle, all the stuff in the middle of the distribution, the typical values. When the supercell composite is smaller in that 2 to 8 range, <coughs> storm rotation is better. When you get over here into the 8 to whatever range, storm rotation, and this is radar measured rotation, so it does correspond as the super cell composite increases, storm rotation tends to increase on average. So there is a physical link between them. All right, what are weaknesses of this? It doesn't tell you anything about storm initiation. Nothing. I mean, there, there's no, there, there's nothing in there, so you can have a super cell composite of 100, and if you don't get a storm, it does not matter. 
then of course, you know, it is sensitive to the storm motion estimate when you get into the low end and storm out the velocity things. And I'd say putting the cart before the horse, because if you're, by assuming the storm motion, that's a right moving supercell, haven't you already kind of answered your own question? You've already, you've already decided there's going to be a supercell by assuming that. So there, there's some question about how to handle that. But overall, this works in a statistical sense pretty well. Now the strengths of it is it's a really easy, simple way to estimate supercell potential. It covers a wide range of environments, surface-based and elevated storms. You don't have to change based on assuming an answer up front. And there is a physical basis in the processes related to a rotating storm. All right, now we piece it together, we'll get to the good old significant tornado parameter and deal with significant supercell tornadoes. And again, our host, I don't know, I get sick of all your pictures, Roger. <laughs> if I had one of them that looked like this, just one. Yeah, I, could, I, I would put mine up there if I had anything better, but I just don't. Okay, significant tornado parameter. We're doing the same thing we're doing with the supercell composite, except now we're going to account for the different ingredients that are related to low-level updraft stretching and low-level rotation. So we still need the supercell part of it. We need a, ro a rotating long-lived storm that's reproducible. That's the supercell composite part of this. We also have to focus on the buoyancy, convective inhibition, and the shear near the ground, which gives us the idea of how strong is a rotation, how close to the ground, and how much resistance is there to that low-level force descent. And then we have to say something about the air flight downgrade. Is that air potentially stable, or is it relative? Could it be relatively unstable? That curious case with an unstable downgrade. All right. So when we put this together, we look at a whole bunch of cases. Now we're going to use the mean parcel case. Why do you think we changed from the most unstable cable to the 100 millibar mean down to the ground? Any ideas why we would switch the buoyancy terms for this one? Are you aware of a lot of significant tornadoes with elevated storms? 300 miles north of the warm front. If, if the updraft is not rooted at the ground, it doesn't matter. So, we're, we're, but we don't want to look at just surface-based cable because that's very sensitive and is usually to the observations and it's usually an overestimate. So whatever's feeding the updraft is some kind of mean parcel. And 1,000 joules per kilogram is just typical. That's a run of the mill value. Effective bulk wind difference, 20 meters per second. That's the same as the previous one. Effective storm relative velocity, on the other hand, is noticeably stronger in tornado environments. There's a much stronger low level shear in the background. So we normalize to instead of 50, it's 150 is kind of a typical low wind value. And then we add a couple of other terms here. We do the goofiness with the LCL height, because LCL is weird where lower is better. Everything else is bigger is better. This one is lower is better. And then we also consider convective inhibition. These two are sort of getting at the problem. How much resistance is there going to be to the forced descent in the walls of the storm? If you have a lot of inhibition, it's hard for the storm to reproduce itself. And if the LCL heights are high, your margin for error diminishes as far as your characteristics of the roof line down. Now we again, it's completely conditional. You have to have a supercell before any of this matters. And of course, we've talked about a lot of what are really complex physical processes. And I mean, you can imagine that it's not going to work equally well in all scenarios. And a storm forming versus a storm persisting are kind of two different questions. And they're difficult to handle that with one formulation. So that would be a weakness. An existing storm may behave a little differently than trying to get a storm to form in the first place. And of course, if you think that we can get the rear flying downdraft character 100% right based on this one value in the background environment, you're crazy. So the precipitation types, are they little bitty drops? Is it big scattered hailstones? Is it a whole bunch of little melting hail? There's all kinds of stuff that drives how strong the downdraft is that we just can't account for. And again, it's the vorticity generation within the RFD. That's another level buried into the mess that's even harder to figure out. So we can't actually estimate any of these directly, but when you combine the measures of deep layer and low level shear, buoyancy, LCL height, and convective inhibition, statistically, it does a pretty good job separating out the significant tornado cases from the ones that 
All right, well, that's pretty much all I have. And I'd say if you guys have not watched the video, I'd say you could also Google Genesis EF5. It's Leorf's 30 meter grid spacing simulation of the Piedmont Super Cell from May 24, 2011. It's a fantastic simulation, but you can actually see these airstreams in motion. You can follow the paths of these air parcels, and the stuff I've been talking about is illustrated. It's about a 15 minute video. It took them weeks to run this. I mean, it, it is a talk about a tremendous amount of uh, information in there. It's not something you're going to run on your laptop. No. So anyway, that's all I got. Appreciate your time, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions if you have any.